It's been 2,000 years since the glorious light of the cross illuminated a world veiled in darkness and confusion about the character of God. And still today, the greatest need of mankind is a revelation of God's love as revealed in the life of Christ. Amazing Facts presents the Everlasting Gospel. Coming to you each week from Sacramento Central Church in sunny California. Discover hidden treasures in God's Word today. This morning I'd like to talk to you about something that is both near to my heart, biblical, and very, very important. Uh, the message this morning is going to be titled very simply, Evolution, Creation, and Logic. And we're going to talk about one of the philosophies or themes, an underlying teaching that has done a lot to uh, erode faith in God's Word and create confusion in our society. Uh, we need to begin with a starting point. I will submit to you that there is no conflict between science, real science, and biblical faith. Uh, that there's a perfect harmony that exists there. But everywhere you turn in our culture, and it's now becoming more worldwide in its scope, there is a teaching of the theory of evolution that is being pushed. And if you resist that, uh, you're looked upon as uneducated or ignorant. It is, in essence, a religion of evolution, in my opinion. It is very much a religious belief because it takes much more faith to believe in evolution than it does to believe in creation. Now, and this is my opinion, I'm going to be sharing with you a lot of information in this presentation, uh, and I'll, you pray for me. I'm going to do my best to cover some of the high points of why I believe that creation is a logical conclusion for our existence. Evolution is, in my opinion, a religion. A religion I used to be an adherent of. I grew up believing in evolution. It's something I was taught. And who is it? Vladimir Lenin who said, a lie told often enough becomes truth. Uh, that, of course, is a little bit of sarcasm, meaning that if you say something to people often enough, they'll believe it is a fact no matter whether or not it's a lie or, or that uh, there may be no facts to substantiate um, this belief. Keep in mind, the reason I say evolution is a religion, would you agree with me that some religious people become very defensive and zealous about spreading their belief? There is a movement, there is a drive, there is money being invested, there is a zeal, there is a militant effort to spread the evolutionary teaching. It was first introduced a number of years ago uh, under the format of being a theory. The word theory is not connected with it anymore. It is being taught as a fact that must be embraced and if you don't embrace it then it is because you are a religious fanatic, you're ignorant, you have your head buried in the sand. A case in point would be uh, last year National Geographic came out with a magazine and the cover art article read, the cover page read, was Darwin wrong? Of course, Darwin has sort of become the focal point for the theme of evolution. And when you turn within the magazine, this is National Geographic, November 2004, you turn within the magazine before you read the first bit of information, it says, no, he wasn't wrong. The evidence is, for evolution is overwhelming. Now, did you notice something there? First it's beginning with the question, then it says, we'll answer the question for you. Now we'll attempt to prove our answer. That is the very approach of evolution. It can't be wrong. Now let's do our best to prove it. And we're going to say that our information, our evidence is overwhelming. Well, we're going to consider some of the things that you would find in that article in our presentation this morning. Uh, I should begin by being very clear with you. Not only did I tell you that I used to believe in evolution, I want to tell you why I used to believe in evolution. Not only was it taught in a number of schools I attended, it was a choice 
my lifestyle was convicted by religion. I went to some religious schools where they taught creation or did not totally t teach evolution. And I went to a number of secular schools, public schools. We all know, for instance, that we're here. Everyone agree with that? Of course, there are some religions that teach that your reality is different from other people's reality, and we don't know whether we're here or not. It's just your perception. But uh, I don't believe that. I believe we are here. I believe your consciousness of being here is just as valid as my consciousness of being here. It's normal to ask about the mystery of life. How did we get here? I think we all agree there are, we're surrounded by miracles of life that seem to denote that there's some intelligence. The question is, is it by design or accident? There's really only two choices. We're here because there's an intelligence, a design, a purpose, or we are here because everything is just an accidental occurrence of biological forces. If the second is true and evolution is true, there is no purpose to life. You can live any way you want. There is no God you will be accountable to. The reason that the religion of evolution is so important to so many is because they don't want to be accountable to God. They do not want to be held responsible for their actions. And so the devil has a vested interest in using every energy, every amount of deception and clever device he can in spreading this religion of evolution because if people realize there's a God that we're accountable to, if he created us, then he's the last word. We're accountable to him and we'll answer to him someday. Then people cannot go on in their sins. Not understanding this truth regarding evolution and creation is going to skew your whole worldview and it begins to open the door for misunderstandings regarding the validity of marriage, about racism, about uh, sin and uh, fooling with life and suicide and so many things that are plaguing our society can be traced back to evolution. Something I learned growing up is the highest group in our society that commits suicide are the teenagers between the age of 11, 22 that's where most people take their lives that group increased when evolution began to be taught as a fact in our schools because the young people are being brought up to think they're nothing more than biological accidents there is no purpose to life they realize that they think that God has no plan for them and they say if we're just going to die and there is no eternity then why not get it over with and suicide becomes an option can you see that but if God is true and his word is true suicide is not a solution to make things better suicide permanently seals a bad situation and you remove all of your options I grew up believing in evolution a matter of fact, keep in mind, some people think that you're ignorant if you believe in creation. I was a high school dropout believing in evolution. The more educated I became, I have a doctorate now, I believe in creation. So actually, the reverse is true. Don't believe that myth that it's only ignorant people. It's the ignorant people that le listen to the biased doctors and scientists that cling to this view that are being deceived. And I know that what I'm saying is very volatile and you may have some passionate views on this and you may disagree with me, but I'm still going to share what I believe. I'm going to give you about a dozen reasons why I believe that creation is really the logical thing to believe. It is the logical truth. We have to look at the evidence. We have to look at what's going on in the world and then play those things out and uh, come to our various conclusions. Um, for one thing, first reason I'd like to offer for you is we are surrounded by evidence of intelligence and design. So reason number one would be intelligent design. Evolutionists believe in spontaneous generation, that single cells of life began in, on their own in warm puddles without a designer and um, even though they've got the capacity built in to, to eat, to eliminate waste, to reproduce, and to propel themselves, 
Keep in mind what was going on in the world when evolution first took off and went into orbit. A number of things that you need to consider. Louis Pasteur was making some progress with very primitive microscopes. When they looked at a cell, they called it a simple cell. Have you ever heard that phrase before? A simple cell. Now we have microscopes that are a thousand times more powerful than the very simple microscopes that they had back in Darwin's day. And we know that a single cell of life, listen carefully, picture in New York City, New York City during rush hour. Think for a minute in your mind, get this picture of all of the communications, the wires going through the buildings, the cell phones, the irrigation, the plumbing, the electronics, the taxis, the subways, the people, the elevators. Think of all the transistors that make New York happen. Think of the complexity of life of New York City at rush hour. Now here's what one modern doctor says after examining what's going on in one cell of life. One simple cell of life we now know is more complex than New York City at rush hour. What are the chances of that happening by accident? You know, this has been put forth many ways. Some have said the idea of life happening spontaneously, and you know, ultimately they call it the Big Bang. All different variations of the Big Bang, but the idea is that at one point something exploded in these galaxies and they say it all came from matter that may have been compressed smaller than the head of a pin and it exploded and expanded it continued to expand and all these different gases and forces went spiraling out forming the different uh, universes or the uh, galaxies and solar systems and the idea of the interworking systems and organization and design coming from explosions is so absurd someone compared it to um, dropping a bomb in a pile of logs and getting a log cabin. What are the odds of that? <laughs> what are the odds of giving a monkey a typewriter? How long would it take him to produce an Encyclopedia Britannica? Can you throw a bomb in a junkyard and get a Boeing 747 or the space station? It's just as plausible to believe in evolution that the organization and the intricate design that you've got in a single cell of life, not to mention the human body, could happen by something exploding. Now, to some extent, I believe in the Big Bang. I think that God said it and bang, it happened. The Word of God can't produce things, yeah, but there may not have been a bang. The other issue would be, point number two, the complexity of life. Someone said that uh, in Daniel Defoe's Robinson Crusoe, Caruso was walking down the beach and he saw footprints one day and they weren't his feet. And just those footprints in the sand told him, I'm not alone. There's someone else on the island. Was he right? Is that a logical deduction? Very simple. Footprints in the sand. Can we see the footprints of God in our world? I went riding this last week with my boys and some friends way back in these remote mountains and we went across mountaintops. And it was quite a sight to see because the only time I could ever call Karen is I had to ride to the top of a 7,000 foot mountain. And I, was, I had no cell phone reception. My friend said, some of you remember Rob Casebolt, he said, hold it over your head. I'm on top of a 7,000 foot mountain. He said, hold it over your head, it might help. <laughs> so we had been praying on the way up, it would work. So I held my phone over my head and it worked. I got a signal. So we made all our calls standing on top of our ATVs on top of a mountain. But while riding across these mountains, we came across a few places where three or four stones were piled up on top of the mountain. We looked at those three or four rocks and we thought, someone has been here before us. There is a sign of organization and design that could not happen by itself. If we could figure that out, and these are rocks sitting on a mountaintop, that that took intelligence, how much more intelligence would it require for all of the organization and the design and the symmetry that you see in the world today. Pardon me, but the idea of it happening spontaneously is absurd. Let, let me give you, uh, how many of you have heard the illustration about the mouse trap? Now I can't see your hands, but I think there must be some out there. <laughs> how many of you heard the mouse trap? This is not a mouse trap. I wanted to be different, so I asked Bonnie to find me an egg beater. I don't know where she got this. Do they still make these? Yeah, they do still make them. If you looked at something like this, 
would you immediately assume that an intelligence produced it? How many would agree? Could you throw bombs at rock for years and never get one of these? No. Hand grenades, it didn't matter. No matter how you arrange the bombs, would they ever produce one of these? No. This, this required intelligence. The interesting thing about this is it's a combination of three or four things. You've got a handle, you've got a crank that manipulates the gears to the shafts and the little blenders. I used to use one of these to comb my brother's hair when I was growing up. <laughs> now, if you take the handle by itself, does it serve a purpose? If you take the crank and the gears and set it off, if we disassemble this, which would take some work in itself, if you disassemble this and you put the gears off by themselves, would it serve any purpose? What about the blenders? If they're separated by themselves, you could probably still whip eggs, but it wouldn't do what it does when it's combined. This would never evolve because in order for it to be what it is, all the pieces have to come together at the same time. The handle would never say, you know, I think I'd be more fulfilled if I had blenders attached to me and develop blenders. If you try to crank the, the, the crank without the handle, you get this, this action. It does, it's like a helicopter without the rotor. It, it needs all of the different components to work. I don't know if I'm making myself clear. There are millions of examples in nature and creation of things infinitely more complex than a mouse trap or an egg beater that would never evolve because in order for them to serve their purpose they all would feel they'd all have to have this need to be together all at one time you remove any component it ceases to work does that make sense the cells of life a matter of fact probably this is a good place to lead into point number three symbiotic relationships we are surrounded in nature with what we would call symbiotic relationships. Insects and flowers. There are many flowers that will not pollinate unless they are pollinated by the proboscis that comes out of the nose of the butterfly. And if you go to the um, rainforest, there are some orchids that have a, a funnel that is a foot deep and there is a moth that just so happens to have a proboscis that unwinds that far and he only pollinates that orchid. What are the chances of an orchid surviving for millions of years not being able to be pollinated until a moth happens to develop the ability to pollinate that orchid? They would have to happen simultaneously. The food in your stomach is being digested because we have a symbiotic relationship with certain microbes and bacteria. They're called friendly bacteria. Are you Are aware of that? And that's why sometimes if you've been sick and you, you uh, take an antibiotics, they tell you you ought to eat some yogurt. You know what you're doing? You're reintroducing some of those friendly bacteria, a culture where they can grow, to bring your digestion back where it's supposed to be. The relationship between bees and the, the flowers. And there are relationships between sea anemones and clownfish. And the little clownfish are immune to the poisonous touch of the anemones and they keep the anemones clean and vice versa they scrub each other and there are fish that uh, open their mouth and other fish go inside and there are birds that clean the ticks off the backs of rhinoceroses and all throughout nature there are fungus and trees that have these relationships that would only exist if they developed simultaneously it could never have evolved that way then of course you've got something that's called the law of entropy evolution operates on the basis that things are getting better. But every, now I didn't say the theory of entropy, it's the law of entropy, which is the inevitable and steady deterioration of a system or society from order to disorder. Everything we observe in the world today, anything left to itself without outside energy being put into it, without intelligence being added to it, it falls apart. If you see a beautifully landscaped yard in gardens and flowers and the owner of the house dies and it is not kept, what happens? It goes to weed and the grass starts to grow and the paint begins to peel and it all begins to implode over time. There, and, and that is a very simple fact that can be seen all through nature. Anything left to itself 
will begin to deteriorate to work its way down. Evolution is teaching the exact opposite of what we scientifically observe in the universe. The orbit of the moon around the earth is slowing. It's not speeding up. Matter of fact, it's slowly spiraling further out from the earth every year. And I forget what it is. It's uh, in a thousand years, it's 800 feet or something like that. It gets further out. And you know, that works in the scenario of the earth being young, 6,000 years old. You can have the moon going out every thousand years, 800 feet, and still be in its orbit. But based on that scenario and those measurements, if the earth has been here for billions of years, the moon would have been rubbing against the earth based on that spiral. And just everything we see in the galaxies around us and what they call the expanding universe, things are not getting better, they're breaking down. They were started by the Lord during creation, but evolution is teaching that things are somehow spiraling up and getting better. Then you've got what we would call the flood of evidence. When you look around the world, and I saw it again just last week. This is one of the reasons that made me think of it. We drove by Pyramid Lake, which is over there in Nevada. And you could see where at one time on the strata in the hillside surrounding the lake, there are lines. You could take a level with a transit, put it in the ground, and you could follow that line on the hillsides. It would be perfectly level. You know why? Because water always levels itself in our world. The water had been at a much higher level at one time. And I have been in New Mexico and seen places where you're 8,000 feet up in the mountains and there's seashells everywhere as far as you could see. You could just dig them out of the hills. The dinosaur bones and the bones and the fossils that we find around the world. Do you know how you get the, multi the um, multitude of fossils that you find around the world? There had to be some cataclysm that caused a tremendous flood because the way you get fossils is all this mud and silt covers something quickly and it dies and it is pressed down and it leaves the impression. You don't get uh, fossils when something dies and lays on the surface of the ground and blows away. It must be covered. Otherwise, if a person dies or an animal dies and it lays on the surface of the earth, um, insects, decomposition, animals of carrion, they break it apart and they carry it off and you don't get a fossil. It must be covered quickly by mud. For years the scientists tried to say, well how did the evolutionary scientists, how did the dinosaurs die off? And they had all these theories of disease, changes in the atmosphere, and finally they had to come to the conclusion, you know we found all these fossils in great heaps together covered with silt. They obviously died in some cataclysmic flood. They could not deny it any longer. The evidence was so overwhelming. So you know what they said? Instead of saying, well, maybe there was a worldwide flood like the Bible says. They said, an asteroid must have hit the earth and caused a flood and buried all the dinosaurs. Have you heard this before? They're trying to find a way to get around the Bible account and still account for the fact that there's obviously been a global flood. Everywhere you look in the world is the evidence. Everywhere I've been in the world, I've seen the evidence firsthand with my own eyes. One of the things that turned me from being an evolutionist to a creationist was when I was living in this canyon in Southern California and I could see evidence of high water and this is an 11,000 foot mountain I could see evidence of high water way up in those mountains and I thought I was reading the Bible at the same time that there really was a global flood now I was one of those people who first tried to take my evolutionary beliefs and mix them with the Bible and I said well those seven days of creation really were probably ages now, have you run into Christians that believe that? They try to make, they don't want to be embarrassed because evolutionists love to scowl and look down upon people who believe in creation as though they're ignorant. Don't be intimidated by that. You have nothing to be ashamed of. The lack of evidence is on the side of the evolutionists. They have the burden of proof. You cannot show from scientific observation an example of organization and design and interworking systems coming from chaos anywhere that is observable in the universe. You cannot, and this is for me, a slam dunk. If they believe that life began spontaneously without any intelligent input or assistance, 
then why can't any of the scientists or evolutionists anywhere in the world produce one single example of a cell of life being produced by a scientist? Can we manipulate life? Oh yeah, we can do in vitro and we can do test tubes and we can do all kinds of things where we take the life that God has made and manipulate it. But can we produce a single cell of life no matter what kind of uh, laboratory environment we create? They have not been able to do it once and yet they say it happened all over the world. Really? That's not very scientific. If it's scientific, show me. Now can I show you where God created? No. But I can prove that you don't get intelligent systems and order and design from chaos. That is something, if you look at a car, one thing you know is somewhere there's a car maker. Am I right? And there have been many evolutionists who have been overwhelmed by the evidence. They look at a painting, they know there's an artist. They look at the book, they know there's an author. You cannot have intelligent or creation and design without uh, intelligence co uh, cooperating with that. Then, of course, you've got the living fossils that are an embarrassment. I did an amazing fact about this a little while ago. Uh, for years, they had these fossils of these fish that are called coelacanths. You've got uh, one of them there on the screen. They were believed to be extinct. 65 million years was the date they put on the fossil. 65 million years. That's a long time. That's in writing. 1938, someone fished one up near Indonesia. And I've got pictures there of someone swimming with a living example of a coelacanth. They are very rare. They only find them in the oceans around Indonesia. But, uh, and they used to say they were proof for how the fish walked out on land. They said they, you, this is one of the missing links. The coelacanth, those are called proto-legs. You can see the fins? They said those are proto-legs. They're developing feet. Well, at 65 million years later, they're still swimming with them just the same way. They never did learn how to walk. Matter of fact, they're in very deep oceans and they have no desire to walk. You try to get them to walk and they die. <laughs> so it, it's a desperate attempt to believe something. Then you've got the horseshoe crab. And um, horseshoe crab, they say, is a living fossil because they find fossils and they say that they are, you know, 150 million years old and yet the fossils which you see on the screen and a living one I used to live on the Atlantic seaboard you can see them they all swarm up on the beach how many of you have seen horseshoe crabs that lived on the east coast they swarm up they're a real menace too kind of creepy when they crawl they fall over on their back I don't I guess. <laughs> but uh, the fossils they've got that they said are 150 million years old are identical to the modern ones and it is a real mystery why horseshoe crabs have what they call a primitive eye how come it didn't get any more advanced if evolution is true? Why did they stop right at horseshoe crab? And a number of other examples. People will say the sharks are one of the most, they're living fossils because they've remained virtually unchanged for so many years. And, and the, what else? The alligator is a living fossil. And of course the clams have not changed in millions of years because they're found in all different strata. Let me share something with you that uh, evolutionists don't want you to know. During the global flood, when creatures die, different kinds of creatures, reptiles, mammals, amphibians, bodies have different gases and density. They will sink and float at different times. In other words, suppose that you were to take a dozen lizards and a dozen mice, throw them in an aquarium, drown them all, observe them, you'll see that the lizards will sink first days before the mice bloat and float to the top. The lizards will sink first. They will get covered by sediment first. The reason the dinosaurs are found deeper at deeper levels is because they were reptiles. They sank. They were covered by silt sooner than the mammals had floated. They are found at different levels. It is something that is observable scientifically today. But they, they say that these fossils are millions of years old. You know how they date many of the fossils? Listen carefully. I'm getting ahead of myself. They date the fossils based on the strata of earth where they find them. If they're deeper, they're older. Do you know how they date the strata of earth, the layers of earth? Based on the fossils. Are you listening carefully? You ask them, so how do we date these strata? Well, it's based on the fossils that we found there. So how do we date the fossils? Based on the strata where we find them. It's circular reasoning. Talk about a desperate effort to try to prove something that isn't true. Now, here is where a lot of people get confused. Do I believe in evolution? Yes. 
I believe in microevolution. Let me explain. In the articles that you'll find in National Geographic, especially in that one where they talked about was Darwin right? They talk about where Darwin went to the Galapagos Islands and he found all these different varieties of finches and that must be proof of evolution. Well, that's called microevolution. Microevolution is very different from macroevolution. Let me see if I can read a definition for you here. Microevolution refers to varieties within a given type. Change happens within a group, but the descendant is clearly the same type as the ancestors. This might be better called variation or adaptation, but the changes are horizontal in effect, not vertical. Now, how many of you would agree that the skeletons that you will find of dogs could be vastly different based on whether or not it is a Great Dane or a Chihuahua? In that article about dogs, it traces all of the dogs back to two original dogs that were wolves or wolf-like. Well, that's what the Bible says. Noah didn't need to have two dachshunds and two chihuahuas and two poodles and two of all those dogs on the earth. The DNA of all the dogs in the world can be traced back to common ancestors that were probably very much wolf-like. That's why the wild dogs, the dingoes that you find in Australia, and then you've got the coyotes in North America, and almost in Africa, you've got the African dogs. Every continent has its wild dog, but they share the same DNA. Now, why do I take so much time to talk about this? You would see vast differences in the skeletons among those dogs. What about, now go to the, the slide about people. Do we see differences in people on the earth? Does that mean that we've evolved from different creatures or in the DNA of Adam and Eve was all the variety that you see sitting around you right now I'm gonna say something that is um, very volatile but it's truth you want to hear it when was the theory of evolution developed and taking off what time in history roughly Oh, 1844 he took his voyage on the Beagle and began to write his thesis was slavery an issue in the world back then are you aware that one of the arguments in favor of slavery were people saying that some people are not as human as others? That they haven't evolved as far as others? And it is beyond me how any African American could embrace evolution. Because really it was forged in the bowels of trying to prove that some humans are more highly developed than others. That was the context of what was happening. Why did Adolf Hitler want to kill all the Jews and certain people? Didn't he believe in the Aryan race was more highly developed and superior to others? You see what I'm saying? Embracing evolution is really embla embracing the idea of survival of the fittest. It's embracing racism. It's embracing euthanasia. And it's okay to kill those who are inferior. Because what happens in the animal world? It's survival of the most superior species. You take it to its ultimate extreme and that's where you're going to land. Missing links. I've got news for you. They're still missing. <laughs> oh, but Pastor Doug... How many times have we seen on TV or read articles about how they've found these missing links? Let me give you a classic example of what they find. Here's a Time magazine uh, a few years ago uh, where how man began. Now what you've got there on the cover is a picture that is exhibit A of what happens. They will find particles of a skull somewhere in Africa. No other bones. They won't find complete skeletons. They'll find particles of a skull and a very ambitious evolutionist who, by the way, is being funded in order to find things. If he stops finding things, he loses his funding or her funding. You listening? They are extremely motivated to talk to their benefactors and say, you'll never guess what we found. We found a missing link. They will find a little piece of bone here, a bone here, a tooth here, and they will then take a lot of plaster of Paris, which you can see in the gray, and they say, see, when we fill in the gaps, this is what it looked like. Now, first of all, let's just suppose that they are accurate, but it looks like they took a lot of liberties there trying to make it look ape-like. Let's just suppose. I just showed you all the diversity of skeletons you can find among dogs, and you know what? They're all dogs, right? How much diversity do we find among skeletons of human? I won't ask you to look at the skull of the person next to you. 
But I'd venture to say that all, we got a lot of different looking skulls. And as you go around the world, they made a big deal about saying down in the Philippines they found this new race of prehistoric missing links because they're only about three feet tall. And that's their argument. Do we have races of people in the world today that are four feet tall? Called pygmies. That doesn't mean that they're the missing links. You've got genetic diversity of humans all over the world. They have never yet found a complete skeleton of anybody that is half ape and half human. What you will find as you go to the museums is a lot of very creative artwork. Sculptors will sculpt what they think Mr. Missing Link looked like and Mrs. Link and all the little missing links and, and uh, they'll paint their pictures and they'll say here's how they spent their day and this is what they, and they'll recreate it. But they don't have them. Not only do they not have the missing link for us to monkey, but they don't have the missing link between the alligator and the rats and between the bats and the birds and they're missing them. The, trans the transitionary species between the different kinds are all absent. I'm just pausing here because I want that to sink in. And yet people believe that, we, you know, the excuse, the argument that is offered by evolutionists for that is they said there were leaps. All of a sudden things change very quickly and uh, there's a spontaneous great generation of change and uh, that's why we don't find because when it transitioned from alligator to moose it did it very quickly. And so there are very few skeletons around. And the reason that they apply the millions and billions of years for these things happening is because they know that you can't observe any case of it in modern history. And so they say, well, because it happens so slowly, we can't observe it. It's like staring at a big clock. You may not see the hands move if it's moving so slowly. You see what I'm saying? But, Doug, you have to admit, there are similarities among the species and you've probably heard do you know that we share 98 percent or 97 percent of the same DNA as chimpanzees we share some DNA with all mammals it doesn't mean that you're a marsupial or a, a, a skunk there are very high percentages of certain things we hold in common because there are similarities among species does not prove evolution let me illustrate that I've got a picture here on the screen I've got a new pickup truck and a car and a motorcycle. Are there similarities between the car and the pickup and the motorcycle? Let's talk about it for a second. Do they all have some lighting system? Do they have uh, inflated tires? Do they have electrical systems? Do they have motors that use oil and gas and exhaust systems? They've got propulsion systems. They've got uh, tail lights, um, speedometers. There's a lot of things. They've got braking systems. Thank you. A lot of similarities. Okay. One is a Kawasaki made in Japan. One is a Ford made in Michigan, I suppose, and one is a, a GMC or Dodge, I forget all made at different factories. Because they have things in common does not mean one came from the other. The motorcycle did not evolve into the car which then evolved into the truck. Why do they have so many things in common? Because they operate in the same environment. Why do many creatures in this world have so many things in common? Because we live in an, a, the same environment where there is water and certain gases. We need to propel ourselves. We need eyes to see in order to know where to propel ourselves. Because we live in the same environment, there's certain similarities. That doesn't mean one came from another. That means that the designer realized there needs to be certain things in common. That's what they say at the factory where they make the motorcycles, the cars, and the um, trucks. We need to design them with these certain things because they have to operate within these parameters. That's why there's similarity in species. It is really ridiculous reasoning to say because there are similarities between your hand and the hand of a raccoon means that you used to live in a tree. But that's the logic that's being used. Um, we're privileged in this church to have a number of uh, doctors, physicians, even some scientists, teachers. And I'm calling on Dr. Steve and Michelle Friend because they're two doctors. Come on up here for a second. Um, your medical doctor? Yes. MD. Veterinarian, yes. you both went to school. Yes. Uh, did you take some education from even some secular schools? They taught evolution in those places. 
Do you believe in evolution? No. Did you? Do we have a microphone? No. Here we go. Thank you, Vicky. Did, did you take some zoology classes, Michelle? Yes. yes. You did. And uh, do you believe in creation or evolution? Creation. Is it because your church mandates it or it seems logical based on your studies? No, it seems logical. Based on your studies. All right, Dr. Steve, all right. You've uh, also probably been exposed to both teachings. Mm -hmm. And uh, do you believe in evolution or creation? Before your presentation, evolution. Right? <laughs> <laughs> are we, we're glad we're making progress. <laughs> oh, thanks. Definitely creation. Is it because it's a church teaching that's mandated and you feel obligated or, and the Bible teaches it? Or is it your reasoning? It's my reasoning. And after taking uh, gross anatomy and dissecting the human body, it's, there's just no other way to tell. You know, it's, it's definitely creationism. All right. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Can you say thank you, Steve, Michelle? Uh, I, I did that deliberately because there's an assumption that, well, it's only uneducated religious zealots, people who are really involved in the medical field or the biological or zoology or studying animals, they know. That's a lie. It's a myth. There are tens and thousands of scientists. Some of them are not even Christians, but they still believe in creation. I was talking to somebody this weekend. Does not go to church does not practice any religion, but if you were to ask him, do you believe in creation or evolution, he'll say, it's got to be creation. Only an idiot would believe in evolution because there, and I don't mean to be, forgive me, I'm not trying to be derogatory, but this is what he said. There is no logical reason that you can embrace the organization and the interworking systems that we see in the universe and in the human body if we look at a car and know that this means that somewhere there's a car maker, how much more complex is a human body than a car? How many of you would agree that it is absurd to look at an automobile and say, it oozed up out of the oil over millions of years? <laughs> because it's got the ignition system and the propulsion system and the braking system and, and the electronics and the cooling system, all these systems that operate with design, you know, there's intelligence there. What is more complex? A car or a human? Matter of fact, when you read the Genesis account, it seems clear that God made the creatures in order of their complexity. He starts out beginning with the land, the environment in which the creatures are going to operate. He makes the air and he makes the land. And then he ends up making the, the separates them and the water from the land. Then he makes the, the vegetation. And some people say that, uh, oh, it was over millions of years that God, th these days are really millions of years. Well, he makes the vegetation on the third day. He doesn't make the sun until the fourth day. How's the vegetation going to live for millions of years without a sun? Well, Doug, if there's no sun, then where was the light when God said, let there be light? God is light. When he came to this chaotic orb, he said, let there be light. He was the source of light. He began to spin the planet that separated day from night. That's not a problem. I believe when it says he made the sun the fourth day, he did it the fourth day. You know why? He doesn't want his worship in the sun. The vegetation can live by the light of God. Anyway, so things got more complex, and then he makes the creatures of the air and the creatures of the water, and then he makes the land creatures, and then he makes man, and finally he makes the most complex creature, which is a woman. Right? <laughs> That's the danger of using both sides of your brain, just complex. <laughs> now, I started talking about the dating dilemma. Let me read something. Everyone said, well, they know because they use, you know, carbon-14 radioisotope dating. Let me read something to you from Compton's Encyclopedia. The whole foundation, you know, a wise man builds his house on a rock. The foundation of evolution is built on the dating information their dating system. If the dating system crumbles, the whole house falls. The foundation is this uh, carbon-14 radioisotope dating. I am reading to you verbatim from Compton's Encyclopedia. Listen very carefully. Carbon-14 is produced in the Earth's atmosphere when nitrogen-14 or N-14 interacts with the cosmic rays. Scientists believe that cosmic rays have been bombarding the atmosphere ever since the Earth was formed, while the amount of nitrogen in the atmosphere has remained constant. They believe it was constant. They don't know. 
Consequently, C14 formation is thought to occur at a constant rate. It's thought to, although the current ratio of C14 to other carbon atoms in the atmosphere is known, that is known, currently it is known, scientists are not certain that this ratio has been constant. Errors in radiocarbon dating can be caused by inaccurate radiation or particle counts, contamination of a sample with more modern carbon, and stray radiation striking the counter. Using relative dating methods, scientists are able to distinguish which events came before others, but usually cannot pinpoint precisely when the events occurred. If they're saying anything in here, they're saying it is unreliable. Now, suppose that you were to see a candle burning in a room. I open a door and you walk in the room and I say, here's a candle burning. You work with the CIA, FBI, and I say, you need to tell me how long has that candle been burning? Well, what can you do? Let's use science. You can say, let's measure how fast it's burning now, how much candle is burnt. Look at a watch and say how long the candle was burning. You can measure the rate of burn, can't you? Yeah, you can measure the rate of burn. But you have to know how tall was the candle when it started. Am I right? Do you know that yet? Well, you can try and measure the amount of wax that is left at the base of the candle and measure how much wax is being consumed and offset it and get an idea how much was there. To begin with, you might be able to guess like that. But you don't know what the shape of the candle was. Was it the same shape all the way up or maybe it went wider as it went up? may have gone narrower, right? Or are you aware that when you open the door and enter that room, that the air content in that room changed and the candle can burn now at a different speed than it did before you opened the door. Was the earth once radically different before the flood? Was the vegetation much deeper? Fossil record, if it says anything, says that the atmosphere around the world used to be a lot more tranquil. There are ferns, lush ferns and, and um, coal beds Saudi Arabia is a desert today. All that oil underneath there, where do you think that comes from? That comes from copious amounts of vegetation that was very quickly covered and compressed and formed these oil deposits and coal deposits that used to be peat moss. They know that. They know the planet used to be a virtual garden that went through some cataclysm that quickly covered these, this vegetation and formed a lot of the fuel reserves that we're living on today. The dating method doesn't work because the atmosphere changed. And so the, the foundation that we're using is inaccurate. I was uh, talking with um, uh, Ron Ritterskamp, who teaches at our school, specializes in this area, and uh, listening to some doctor's tapes, Kent Hovind and others. They pulled a woolly mammoth out of the hole up in Siberia. They decided to send to get an accurate dating method. They sent one end of the mammoth to one laboratory and another end to another laboratory. One end dated it 10,000 years, the other one 20,000 years. Different ends of the same mammoth. 100% error. You realize that? That's what that represents. They take clams out of the ocean today. Wait one year and date them, they'll date 1,000 years. It's affected by, also, do you know if you take uh, an object and you cover it with a saline solution for a year and then date it, it will date much older. You listening? Cover it with a saline solution. Was the whole world covered with a flood? Would that affect all the fossils that were influenced by the flood? Isn't salt water a saline solution? It throws the whole dating system out the window. It is very, very inaccurate. Um, I'm going to have to rush along because I'm almost out of time here. Another thing that I think is important, another point, 11, is the history of history. If man has evolved slowly over millions of years and just began to kind of drag his knuckles and walk upright, you know, 250,000 years ago, and then he learned to kind of make some primitive tools, and they've got this scenario about how we developed all of a sudden, it appears that 4,400 years ago, all over the world, man suddenly became extremely sophisticated and intelligent. Because you look around the world and you can see these very bright civilizations like the Egyptians built the pyramids. When do these civilizations date back? None of them dates back any more than 4,000 years ago. I'm talking about the written history 
the great archaeological sites. You look at the civilizations of Central America, North America, South America. You go and you look at the temples in um, Indonesia and Burma and there was obvious great intelligence and engineering skill. I have been on islands out in the South Pacific. Any of you ever been to Ponape? Anyone here ever been to Ponape? We've got a mission work Ponape. Did you go to Nanmadal, Dr. Baker? There's this place called Nanmadal that is a civilization. It's in, I think it's 50 acres, a temple that was built. They've got these basalt columns, some of them the way 50 tons. They don't know how they moved them. You ask the natives that live there today and they'll say, we don't know how it was done. We didn't do it. <laughs> they know that. But there was some civilization that built this extensive, it, it's called the Venice of the Pacific. And I've seen it. It's amazing, this civilization. They don't know. All over the world there's these mysteries. This great intelligence seems to blossom. The oldest trees in the world, how old do you think they are? Well, it's not the redwoods and the sequoias. Some of them can be just about 4,000 years old. The oldest is the bristlecone pine found in our state. Oldest tree in the world. They got one called Methuselah. When they take a core sample, you know how old it dates? 4,300 years is the oldest one. There is no living thing on the planet, no tree beyond that time. Well, you know, the Bible says that the whole world was covered and virtually scraped clean of anything living outside the ark 4,400 years ago. If you examine the evidence, it just really proves the Bible. You don't look at the Bible to arrive at your conclusion. If you look at the evidence, it substantiates what the Bible is teaching. The dating method, the history, and then what about people in the world, the population? Right now, there are, this is my final point, there are approximately 6.3 billion people in the world today. You can do calculations and guess how many people will be in the world. Here's a chart. They're very concerned at the UN about the population growth. But look, it took, according, according to the evolutionists, it took, um, I don't know, three million years for us to get the first billion people. That doesn't add up. In other words, if you look at the population growth of humans today and you analyze that backwards, it tells us that you would be reduced and you factor in famines, you factor in catastrophe, you factor in plagues. It would reduce the human race to roughly a handful of people 4,400 years ago. The evolutionists know this. You know what they say? In order for humans not to be, we would be covering the planet if man has been here for 10,000 years, only 10,000 years, multiplying the way we do now, we would be covering the planet shoulder on top of shoulder, side by side, all over the planet right now. Even counting for plagues. The only way evolutionists can account for the population of humans in the world today is to say, on several occasions through history, humans have been decimated, and then a small group of them managed to survive and repopulate. But they've got to keep wiping us out. Because based on current populations, we couldn't have been here the millions of years, they say. And you know what is really creating a problem for the evolutionary teaching is DNA. DNA is an accurate science. Here's a map of the DNA tracking the flow of man around the world. I did not produce this map. It is not produced by religious groups. It is just a fact that the migration of humankind from around the world, they can now they have found out, I hope I won't hurt anyone's feelings, the Native Americans did not come from the Jews as the Mormons want us to think. The Native Americans came, their DNA is very similar to that of the people in Mongolia and China, mostly Mongolia. You can tell where the migration came from. Isn't it interesting, see where that star is? In the, in the vicinity of that star, they figure, is the cradle of civilization somewhere between Mesopotamia and the mountains of Ararat. Very interesting. Well, that's what my Bible says. <laughs> so you can even look at this evidence. You know, the Bible tells us, as we said in our scripture reading, Acts 17, verse 26, and God has made from one blood every nation of men to dwell on all the face of the earth. And he's determined their pre-appointed times and their boundaries of their dwellings. We are all brothers and sisters. We're not only all related because of Adam and Eve, we are all related because of Noah. And then even more than that, we're all related because of Christ. Our world did not evolve by accident. It was designed and created by God. 
The Bible says in Hebrews 10, And you, Lord, in the beginning laid the foundations of the earth, and the heavens are the work of your hands. Again, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Amen? I don't believe it happened by accident, friends. The more I study, the more the evidence you examine, you're really left with no other conclusion than there is a God that made us. There is a purpose to life. There is a purpose for your life. And part of that purpose is he wants to live and dwell with you through eternity. I'm hoping that it's your desire to believe that you do have a heavenly father. You've been made in his image. You did not evolve. It's the devil's idea to lower that standard and make us act like beasts. Another ad that was in Newsweek magazine showed monkeys on the cover and said, monkeys are not monogamous, so maybe we're not responsible for our infidelity. Can you see where this is coming from and where it's going, friends? This whole evolutionary religion is to undermine the teachings of truth that you find in the Bible. God is a creator. He made you in his image. He has a plan for your life. You believe that? Let's stand. Number 92, this is my father's world. This is my father's world. Our loving Father in heaven, our Creator, we are so thankful that you can call us your children and that we have been made in your image. Lord, I know sometimes we may act more like the beasts than men. We, we do pray you'll forgive us for those times and help us not to live by the flesh but by the Spirit. Restore us to the image of your Son. Help us to behave like the noble creatures that you designed us to be. And help us to realize that you did give dominion of this world to man. That we are stewards of this planet, but it is still your creation. I pray, Lord, that you will give us wisdom to know how to conduct ourselves in this world where we will be scoffed at because we believe we are created. Help us to have tact and wisdom, Lord, as we deal with friends and some family that may be confused on these issues. That we might gracefully labor with them and help them to see the logic of creation. I pray that you will be with us and again help us to live in a way that we can reflect our Creator and our Savior. We thank you and pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.